Hello, my name is Luke Jenkins and I'm an archaeologist for David Archaeological Trust. Today I'm here to talk to you about our fantastic excavations at St. Patrick's Chapel. I'd like to start by recognising our amazing partners in this project and also by issuing a quick disclaimer. This presentation includes photographs of human remains, including children. If anyone is uncomfortable with seeing that, without judgement, unfortunately, this presentation is not for you. So when are we talking about? Well, we're talking about the early medieval and medieval period, so between 410 and 1536 AD. St. Patrick's Chapel itself starts in the 7th or 8th centuries AD and continues right through until the 16th century. So it's a very long period site. Here's a map of the early medieval cemeteries of Pembrokeshire, which is where St. Patrick's finds its origins. St. Patrick's shown as number 16 on the map. And whilst there is an awful lot of them, we don't know very much about them. And that's partly because of later use of these cemeteries, but also because very few of them have been excavated. And the ongoing problem of bone preservation in Wales, uh, caused by the acidity of the soils, making the preservation of such, such remains very, very rare. But also, like to note that a lot of these are coastal, which St. Patrick's most certainly is. We don't really know why so many of them are coastal, but it does seem to be a bit of a theme. Well, the few that has been excavated uh, is called ba Bransley Barrow in Castle Martin on the Tank Range. Um, this one was excavation excavated because of erosion, not this time caused by the coast, but by caused by badgers, which do have a particular pension for uh, graveyards. Uh, they also like making quite a mess, uh, and as a protected species, uh, an artificial set was built 100 metres away and the badgers were encouraged to move. Uh, and an excavation then was undertaken in the disturbed areas. You can see bones in amongst the remains of the set. Some more of the badgers. They did nonetheless find some less disturbed remains. Uh, Firstly, this one, which have been partially uh, excavated by the barrows before us. But the one on the right is a really nice example of a kissed grave, which is something we're going to see a lot more of in this presentation. Kissed graves are basically stone coffins uh, made up of side slabs uh, and so-called lintel slabs, which would have gone over the top of this, and they're basically stone coffins. So where is St. Patrick's Chapel? Well, it's located on White Sands Beach in White Sands Bay, um, which is the most westerly trade beach in Wales. It's worth noting that this has been a coming and going millennium and will have acted as a port um, for basically all of history. So this is St. Patrick's Chapel as it stood at the start of the excavation. You can see the orange fencing roughly marking out where the chapel and graveyard are. Today this acts as the locals picnic area when the beach is full and it is a scheduled monument. As you can see it's pretty spectacular. Uh, this is us on some of the final days of excavation. It's a pretty amazing place to build a chapel and actually we don't think the sea was much further out than where it is today. Maybe 20, 30 metres, but not much more than that. So how do we know that the chapel was there? Well, the truth is we always knew there was a chapel there. It seems to have known through antiquity and it's not going right back. 
Nonetheless, the only antiquated historical reference to the chapel was provided by George Owen on his historical tour through Pembrokeshire, who wrote not far off Capel Patrick, full west of St David's, and placed as near his country, namely Ireland, as it could well be, it is now wholly decayed. Now this passage is quite interesting for a couple of reasons. Firstly, that it shows that it was called St Patrick's Chapel, and by St Patrick they meant Saint, the St Patrick that we all know, um, and also that it is wholly decayed. And this was written in, six, in 1600 or so, um, showing that it was already a ruin by this stage and perhaps pointing to the fact that this is indeed quite an ancient cemetery. So after this, basically the chapel was left. There are occasional references before this time, until it was excavated by Badger and Green in 1924. They basically excavated the interior of the chapel. It's in talks such as this, that I often find myself using the phrase, it's not how we would do it today. However, these people were not standing on a hundred years of development of the archaeological method, and no doubt they were doing their best. Nevertheless, it would have been lovely to see the archaeological deposits within the chapel itself, which were mostly removed during this excavation. The numbers within within this plan, which is the only plan we have, refer to skeletons, which we now know to be much older than the chapel. The chapel was then left to the 1970s, uh, when the site was suffering from severe visitor erosion and a little bit of coastal erosion. As a result, a very small trench was put in by Douglas Haig of the Royal Commission, uh, and, the, and the coast path was redirected away from the site and the ground restored. You can see in that bottom right photo the kind of problems they were dealing with. The very small excavation trench did reveal some quite nice archaeological remains, namely some disgrace, three or four skeletons were excavated and they found this very nice stone inscribed cross, which is very difficult to make out in the photographs. So our journey at St. Patrick's Chapel for David Archaeological Trust starts after the storms of January 2014. These storms were enormous and they were quite violent and came directly from the southwest and onto White Sands Beach. As you can see in the top left, they stripped away much of the sand on the beach and deposited pebbles everywhere else, and significantly eroded the mound. After the storms, a dog walker found remains eroding out the side out the mound, and the, in the kiss grave, and this is the sort of head of the person, as revealed. I think they must have had quite a shock. It's worth noting that this event has passed into myth and legend itself. Uh, I've heard so many different stories of humans being found, of femurs being brought back by dogs, etc. At least some of them are true. So as a result of the storm, and the possible threat of more storms, which were becoming more frequent, uh, the decision was made by Pembrokeshire Coast National Park, who owned the site, to undertake excavations along its most westerly edge. This is marked in green and blue uh, in this in this plan and focused on only the most at threat remains. This is more of a rescue excavation than anything else, particularly focusing on the graves which could be seen already eroding out of the front. So this is Pete Crane on the first day of excavation holding a very fine cross that had been found on the beach, a rare find in its own right and shows you the level of erosion that was going on at the time. And so the first excavations began. The first 
excavation season focused really on those skeletons that were just coming out the front and then the 2015 trench was a slightly wider area to properly understand those remains. So here we are excavating those initial burials that were poking out the front in the first first year of excavation and actually the two trenches strip trenches along the side which would determine to determine the extent of the archaeology to the south and north but also later to the east so the first feature or deposit we found was a car that had been left in the backfill as revetting against the storm which was quite a find and this was lying directly upon kiss graves db and directly, and I mean directly beneath that, were the amusing kiss graves, which we talked about earlier, um, which were amongst the nicest we found. Here are the kiss graves after they have been opened. The skulls have been removed uh, for safekeeping previously. Um, and this gives you a really nice impression of what these graves for. These skeletons date between 900 and 1025 AD, uh, representing some of the later burials on the site. Now at this point, the decision was made to leave the chapel um, with the thought that the most at threat remains had already been removed. Uh, and the parks placed very large boulders up against the site to prevent uh, to prevent further erosion. Now, unfortunately, this was the wrong decision. The, the decision to fight Mother Nature rather than submit to it, usually the wrong one. Um, and those large boulders ended up in the car park uh, on the very next storm. So the decision was made to return to St. Patrick's Chapel between 2019 and 2021, this time funded by the European Union um, through the Ancient Connections Project, which looked for links between the east of Ireland and the very west of Wales, um, particularly with relation to pilgrimage. And the hope was to excavate that this would be safe for at least 50 or 100 years, um, so a significantly larger set of excavations this time. So now for the bit you've all been waiting for, and I'll talk about the uh, results of the excavation. I'll do this chronologically from oldest to youngest. It will start at the bottom. It's worth saying that uh, this chronology is still very much a work in progress. And in fact, of course, it's the oldest things that you excavate last. Therefore, the first things I'm going to talk about here are still in the post-excavation uh, phase and uh, consist of a series of plans and notes and all sorts of things that we're now trying to piece together to get a full picture of the site. So the site can be broken into three phases, phase one, two, three. Uh, phase three actually being the chapel, phase two being a graveyard, and phase one being this sovereign enclosure, um, which we'll talk about now. So whilst I have been referring to this as St. Patrick's Chapel for all this time, uh, I'd like to start by saying that at this stage in the site's history, it most certainly was not a chapel, nor was it a graveyard. Uh, and in fact, what it was, was this oval enclosure, sort of lemon shaped, measuring about four meters across, eight meters long, which we mostly had in the trench, made out of these enormous boulders. Um, on the way in, 
uh, was it was accessed from over a stile made of stone, which I must say might be one of my favourite archaeological finds of all time. Uh, hopping over this gave me no end of joy. And it had a very beautiful quartz pavement, which you can see in the bottom right, uh, which was very poorly preserved because it had been cut through so many times later. So the overall enclosure was built around a rectangular structure. You can see that in the middle here. These are contemporary with one another, but it had been removed in the previous photograph for fears of its safety. It was very, very fragile um, and was actually designed to stand up um, above the floor level. Um, it was a pretty complicated thing. Uh, it was it was built over a pit that had been backfilled uh, with very clean sand in it. You can see it here in the left-hand photograph, around which rectangular upright slabs had been placed, and then the, it had been backfilled. On top of that was placed large lintel stones as it were or a stone covering um, and then at a later date it was covered in course possibly by people coming to see it. Now, as you can imagine this fits very, very neatly uh, with the description that we had earlier of a kissed grave but in fact it does not seem to be that at all and there are certainly no uh, burial remains found in association with it and I mean it was completely sampled uh, sieved on site and then the entire remains of it. Uh, now on the sur surface of it, it does seem quite plain, but in fact when you look closer it was the opposite of that. So on the top slab was this beautiful interlaced cross this was one of the most spectacular things I've ever seen, again. Um, it's a Celtic cross that many of you will have seen before and a design that many of you will have seen before. The curved top may indicate an, quite an early design, quite similar to Irish examples. And Nancy Edwards, the expert on early Celtic art, uh, reckons that this was carved with a knife rather than a chisel and is possibly unfinished. The bottom slab had a very crude cross on it, much more graffiti-like than the previous one. This one had lozen shapes around it. And whilst this may seem very different to the design seen on the top slab, actually that diamond shape is sort of an easier to carve version of what we saw before. Now I skipped over the middle slab because it is by far my favourite. At the top it appears that there is some form of boards, a taffel board perhaps. Um, in the centre there is some possible script, although at the moment we have not been able to decipher this. And at the bottom a little man. This little man is, has got his hands up. Um, and this is the Oran stance, which is sort of the predecessor to the modern praying stance with your hands together. I like to think also that this man is possibly next to the shrine. He, does, he is very much next to a bot. We had some more strange crosses. Um, this one probably quite similar to that bottom slab we described the slide before last, which seems to be more graffiti-esque again. So perhaps the most exciting find archaeologically was on the western upright slab of the structure. On the left is possibly a wave and in the middle a boat. The boat is interesting in its own right because it has both oars and a mast. It also has what we think is a serrage which is sort of a primitive, well it's not primitive, a very effective oar for steering. 
And on the right hand side, no doubt what you've all been looking at, is the inscription Donoek. Patrick Sims Williams, the expert on early Celtic language from Aberystwyth University, tells us that this is an early Irish name which had actually become archaic by the 8th century, so bringing this structure right back even before we have our carbon dating. The n it's a name, Donoek, um, Dono being the person, and Ek referring to small or little or young, so it's young Dono, little Dono, small Dono, or Dono the small, however you want to think about it. So perhaps the most peculiar thing we found was this cross. This cross was found on its side, on the inside of the rectangular structure. So it would have never ever been seen. We think it's actually a reused grave marker and I would love to see the grave which this grave came from. And it also differs from all of the other art in the fact that it is artisan made rather than um, amateur made if you prefer not that the others were not skilled but this one was made using a chisel which requires a much higher level of skill at this point i'd also like to take a moment to reflect on why all of these crosses and art is so important and that's because whilst many of them are crude or simple or however you want to think about it they're important because they are found in scientific conditions on an archaeological excavation Celtic and early medieval art is usually found in association with later sites and repositioned and many people many of you will have been to sites where uh, or churches where you will find great crosses amazing things which have almost always been re-erected or incorporated into later remains. So this art may give us the opportunity to interpret wider art in Wales in a way that we haven't been able to do before. So the final layer as discussed earlier was this quartz which we th think would have completely covered almost all of the art on on the rectangular structure. We wonder whether this had been left over a much longer period, it certainly seems to be more random, by people coming to visit the central feature. On top of the courts was actually another gaming board, uh, Taffel, uh, as mentioned earlier. Taffel is, or is a game similar to chess and actually its predecessor, which was quite typical of the time. It's also important to note that these uh, checkerboards were an apotropaic symbol and used to ward away bad spirits and all sorts of things during this time. On the end of the structure was an upright slab and this seems to have been placed again later when the rectangular structure was falling out of sight um, just to mark where it was so it obviously remained important for a long time. So relatively soon after the construction of this oval enclosure there is a, thi a thin layer of charcoal and we think this represents craft working within the enclosure it's quite thin but on the outside it's much thicker and represents probably ongoing craft use for qu in quite a meaningful way for a significant amount of time within this debris was large amounts of charcoal as you can see but also things such as amber working molds for bronze working and bone and all sorts of things stuff that you wouldn't necessarily normally expect with a holy site so here's just a sli slide showing it on the outside where it was much thicker much more dense and actually quite a significant thing so you may have noticed that i have been fairly cagey or i've avoided saying what this thing actually is and that's partly because there are no real parallels in Wales. Its location next to the sea is important and we can certainly identify it being important within the Christian faith. 
It is also a place of coming to going, coming and going, and possibly a place of prayer, perhaps before going to sea and before coming back. The later associations with St. Patrick may also be important. The supposed place where St. Patrick did leave for Ireland is White, White Sands Beach after all, and it is the most westerly place in Wales. It's a, again, at times like this, I like to think about how we are only 40 miles from Ireland at this point and over 200 miles from England. And it is in Ireland that we find our best comparisons. So these are something called Lech Shrines, which are a form of early Christian site in Ireland. They tend to be small and square, different from St. Patrick's, but nevertheless very similar in proportion more generally. They're not a place of burial again. They seem to be a praying place, usually found in association with early monastic sites. And they are fairly common and fairly well known and are associated with large amounts of Celtic art. So whilst it's not an exact match, we do have to ask ourselves, is this a place with an Irish identity in Wales? And that's a really, really exciting prospect, especially for a project funded to look at ancient connections between England. Wales and the east of Ireland. So moving on to phase two, this is shortly after the oval enclosure becomes completely inundated with sand. As we said before, the inundation of the sand is what led to such a deep stratigraphic matrix on this site and what led to the amazing preservation. And actually we think the oval enclosure had mostly been covered by sand at this time. Nonetheless, it's probably visible enough that they still knew it was there. So this is about AD 750 to 800. So we don't think that the oval enclosure was in use for a particularly long period of time before they decide to expand that enclosure, building a much more substantial wall around it engulfing the previous lemon-shaped enclosure of phase one. The first phase of burial seems to be almost exclusively infants and children packed in around the rectangular structure which was either partially visible or that upright slab at the end was just visible and in fact in some instances these burials have been cut in to the structure itself to get as close to it as possible. Obviously they saw this circular enclosure and rectangular thing in the middle as really important or very sacred or however you want to think about it and they were trying to get their children as close to it as they possibly can. So after the initial phase of infants we then have a more normal population coming through so adults and sub-adults who were startly, startlingly well preserved. Here you can see two very well preserved individuals basically stacked together and someone cut down from a much higher level, so it's slightly deceiving, right next to the rectangular structure. All of these bodies, for the most part, were buried in a fairly standard Christian way, usually in a shroud, so they were wrapped up with east-west with the head facing towards Jerusalem. So here's a really good example of these burials. This person actually his head has slipped towards the south. But nonetheless you get a picture of how many of them are lied. So-called um, supine position on their backs east-west. In amongst the more traditional burials, or ones we think of as traditional, we did have some real oddities. The person on the right is what's called a prone crouch burial, which is, I must say, something I've never seen before. So he's crouched up with his face towards the ground. The people on the left are prone burials, proper as it were, with their faces head down. And actually there's a third one beneath, it's starting to get a picture of how dense this burial was. Now prone burials are really strange things. Often they're thought of as sort of deviants, so criminals, 
but also they can very much be very holy people. In fact, in the mo modern Catholic faith, people still throw themselves before the, the Pope. And part of that is coming up to meet your congregation at the se second coming. Perhaps the burial most astonishing visually was was this person. This we th fairly sure that this is a bag burial. So this is someone crouched up so incredibly tightly, in fact, to the point where all of their joints must have been dislocated. So they probably had been in a bag for a good amount of time. And this is something which we're beginning to think about. Has this person been brought home? Has this person been brought from afar? Has they have they died at sea? All sorts of things. I will certainly want to look at the DNA and the isotope analysis from this particular skeleton. So in about 830, 900, we start to get kiss graves that we talked about at the start of the presentation. The st basically stone coffins. A really good example of this is on the left, where you can see a upright grave marker with stone slabs surrounding it. And actually, this one was a double decker burial with another one located beneath the one you see there. So in the 11th or 12th centuries, a stone rubble layer was laid across the area, probably as a surface. This layer seems to have been at a point where the rectangular enclosure we talked about in phase two is completely out of sight and the oval enclosure is more than a meter underground. Burials do continue through this period again returning to the 8th century where we only find children and the graves we found were quite unusual often being lined with shells or quartz such as the example on the left which with no lintel slabs which is quite strange one particularly f amazing find from this period was this pin which was pushed vertically into the rubble a hiberno scandinavian pin which were manufactured in ireland in Dublin during this time. So moving on to phase three, this is when St. Patrick's lives up to its name and becomes a chapel. Before this time, there is no evidence of any chapel remains whatsoever. And believe me, we were looking, looking for them, even in the form of post holes. But in fact, she, in fact, those that early enclosure and the larger cemetery seem to be what the site was before this time. So here's the chapel under excavation, as you can see, fo again, focusing on the western end with the enclosure beneath. So it starts to give you an, a picture of how deep the stratigraphy is on this site. So the chapel itself was relatively simply built. It had thick walls which were unmortared, which were constantly repaired through time. And this chapel may have continued from the 12th century right through into the into the 15th or 16th centuries. It had a ledge around the interior, which was very difficult to get our heads around, but we think it was just so somewhere to sit, perhaps. His entrance was in the western end, looking out to sea, the same as the two enclosures beneath it. Although at a later date, this was blocked up due to, well, we think, due to sand inundation, moving it to the south where that would be less of an issue. It's important to note that at this point, it ceases to be a cemetery in any major way. There does appear to be a couple of burials associated it, with it, but for the most part, at this point, it stops being a cemetery and starts being a chapel. So as I said before, the chapel then falls into disrepair after several hundred years use and gradually falls beneath the sand itself before George Owen comes along and d writes about it in the 16th century, 17th century. This slide sh serves two purposes. Firstly, to show the difference in height between the cemetery walls, which you can see people have stood within, and the oval enclosure, which is still not even close to being in sight with the chapel at the very top. And also to note the 
sheer numbers of visitors we had to the site, as well as the volunteers we had uh, during the excavation. In the last season of excavation, which lasted six weeks, we had 17, well, more than 17,000 visitors, which was amazing. And we had uh, someone to show them around at all times and to give guided tours, and uh, we think the project was incredibly well received um, all round. So finally, I'd like to talk a little bit about the people that we found in the cemetery. So the osteological analysis was undertaken by Katie Hemmer of the University of Sheffield, uh, soon to be the University of UCL. And Katie's role in this is to look at the bodies themselves, not so much the burials, which is an archaeological question, but look at the people and we c and she can look at things such as are we missing parts of people you know how fragmented are these these skeletons but also their age sex stature and various traits but also how they died whether they died of something that's visible within the skeleton and what Katie also hopes to do in in the in the coming years and it's a slightly longer process than the initial osteological work uh, is look at stable isotope analysis, so looking at their diets, and also mobility. So strontium and oxygen isotope analysis can tell you broadly whether people are local or non-local in the both at the start of their lives and at the in the last few years before they died, and look at broadly perhaps where they came from. So the demography of the population was unusual even by medieval standards. Katie has asked me to uh, say that these are very preliminary results that are by no means final. We had about 270 individuals buried in a 10 by 8 meter space and because of the packing of these people into this space not all of the skeletons were complete but nevertheless they survived fantastically overall. So 64% of the people were beneath 18, year, 18 years of age, which is, even with youngster mortality, very unusual, and 54% of the population were under 12 months of age, so we had a huge amount of infants on the site. We had slightly more females than would be expected, and the question remains, is this place associated particularly with childhood? Um, and also, as we go on, we want to look at why these people are dying. So we did have some preliminary th thoughts, or Katie had some pre preliminary thoughts, on the health of the population. Particularly there was high levels of poor health of children. Now you could say this is because we have children that have died. But nonetheless we seem to have rickets and high levels of de dental calculus which may be indicative of people being unwell in the early stages of their life. The animal bone analysis was undertaken by Anglos, who is only giving us first glimpses as to what the assemblage is telling us. Certainly this is a large assemblage that will take quite a long time to get through. The, the dominant species seem to be cattle and sheep, particularly sheep, but with other both domesticated and wild animals present. We also saw some unusual things such as otters. I mean, God knows who's eating otters, certainly not me, and that is a, not something I'll be incorporating to my own diet. And we can tell that most of these are being cooked and therefore used. The bird assemblage was also fairly strange. So we had geese, guillemot, herring gull, starlings, thrush and wheat ear. So these are non-domesticated birds in particular. And we can tell that at least some of them are being eaten because they are burnt. Again, it's not something I will be incorporating into my own diet, but is this indicative of a population exploiting their local environment? Seabirds would have been one of the most readily available 
uh, food sources in the area. So I should finish as I started by thanking people. Firstly, the partners that I mentioned at the beginning, and secondly, all of the dedicated archaeologists and specialists who made this project possible and continue to make it possible in the post-excavation phase. From DAT, the names I haven't mentioned are Ken Murphy, the project lead, Jenna Smith, the engagement archaeologist, and Hubert, the illustrator, Hubert Wilson, the illustrator and archaeologist, and most of all the volunteers who really did make this project possible. They moved hundreds if not thousands of buckets of soil and stone and dedicated thousands of hours to making this project possible. It really was a very special thing to be a part of. In fact, it's so good I, I would finish with another slide of happy faces and warm July on our final season, the highlights of the dig. Thank you very much.